Osho's teachings are filled with contradictions. But they all were used to guide individuals towards that center. That was his core approach. He did not have a core philosophy or core teachings, but he had a core purpose. Although, when you ask him what is the purpose of life, he says there is no purpose. The mind of man has undergone a tr tremendous change. It is no longer that calm, still mind that can easily focus on things. Modern mind is very agitated. The attention span is low. It can easily get distracted and it wants quick results. And it does not have all the time in the world to dedicate for meditation. People want quick results. And that's where he started creating different techniques. The dynamic meditation, the cathartic meditation, meditation involving your emotions, bringing the psychological aspects to meditation, tools and techniques that can help you throw out your anger, throw out your fears, and literally use your body as a tool to connect with that center. Now, I will talk about his techniques in detail. Because even there, there is a big misunderstanding. People traditionally understand meditation as an activity that you do quietly. You sit quiet, close your eyes and you meditate. They don't know dancing meditation. They don't know screaming meditation. They don't know sex as a meditation. That's where a lot of misunderstanding came from. Because they could not connect the activities that they were seeing to meditation. Because meditation is something you cannot see. It happens. It was happening in between two activities. But people were only focused on the activities. They cannot show silence on news channels. There was a scientific process that was happening. One core teaching was meditation. The other one was his philosophy. Again, if I can use the term, it was not philosophy in the traditional sense, but words that he used to clear out the obstacles on the path of meditation. So his philosophy was existential. He called himself an existentialist. As a philosopher, if you want to put him in a category, which category would you put him in? He liked to call himself an existentialist. Now, what does that mean? That means he sees everything, the activities of man, the social structure, the political structure, the religious structure. He looks at all that in comparison to existence. Existence has a natural way of doing things. There is a natural flow to how existence works. Now, every time he spoke about anything other than meditation, he was extremely critical of it. That is why he was against marriage. That is why he was against religion. That is why he was against all kind of social indoctrination. He was against formal education. He was against military. He was against the idea of countries and borders. But if you understand what is the core thing here, he was actually not against all those things for the sake of being against. He could see that they are opposed to an existential way of living. 
there is a natural way of living where the human spirit finds its meaning finds its joy finds its purpose the more structures you build around existence around a simple existential way of living the more difficult life becomes you get trapped in these institutions that is why he was against all kinds of belief systems as he himself says i am against all isms and he was an ism is a dead entity buddha is a living entity buddhism is a dead entity christ is a living entity the consciousness the aliveness christianity is a dead entity so is hinduism so is jainism so is sikhism all isms they are walls that are stopping individuals from getting to the center the meat of religiousness now there is no difficulty in understanding why he was like the way he was if you were to be there in the same space if you had found that center and stayed at that center this is how you would have spoken the only difference between osho and many other teachers before is he was extraordinarily well read many teachers could not speak about a lot of things because he was well read he was a professor of philosophy he completed his masters in philosophy he was a teacher of philosophy so you can imagine how many philosophy books he would have read or how many books he would have read literally a professor of philosophy being an enlightened teacher you will not get a combination like that it's a deadly combination but when he spoke there was an intuitive understanding of what he was talking about because he was speaking from that space he simply had to cover an idea he simply had to see it see it in a way people are seeing it so that he can interpret it in his own way and because he was not speaking for any ulterior motive to gain any favors to please someone else he was able to speak openly without any inhibition that became the problem for many people because there was no sense of artificially imposed civilization we don't like uncivilized things we don't like uncivilized people we have an idea of what civilized is osho was anything but civilized he was a wild animal literally he lived just like any other animal in existence totally freely utterly freely but because he was so well read he was aware of so many different dimensions of life that wildness was able to touch so many different aspects of life now what was his core message enlightenment meditation that leads to enlightenment philosophy that helps you to weed out all the unwanted growth to keep your land fertile for the flowers of awakening to bloom that is it there is nothing else to that man his whole life revolved around these few simple things he was a simple man extraordinarily simple 
all the complications were created by people around him. While he was enlightened, people around him were not. They had their fears, they had their desires. In fact, it is not surprising that all that nonsense happened around him because he would not object. He would not even visit the campus. You, he would not even go to the places where people were living to see how they are living, to see what's happening. He had a routine. A routine where he spent majority of his time alone. As he himself says, he spent three hours in the bathroom every day. One and a half hours in the morning, one and a half hours in the evening. And the reporter asks him in one of the interviews, what do you do for one and a half hours in the morning and one and a half hours in the evening? He says, I really enjoy taking shower, cold shower, hot shower, ice cold shower. And he starts explaining how nice it feels, you know, to go into ice cold shower and then you move into a hot shower. This was the man, but the image people had on the outside was something totally different. And he spoke for about five hours every day, two and a half hours in the morning, two and a half hours in the evening. And he slept for 10 hours in the day, eight hours in the night and two hours in, during the day. This was his lifestyle. And once in a while, he enjoyed driving. His disciples had created a separate road for him. A road that was dedicated only for him. Nobody can drive on that road. He enjoyed driving. Well, there is a reason as to why they did not allow him to drive outside because he was not such a great driver. But it didn't matter. He was able to drive on that road because he enjoyed driving. This was his life. He did not know what was happening outside this small world of his. All the noise and commotion happened around him because there is truth in his words. He does not have to do anything. He simply has to speak. His realization, his enlightenment was taking care of everything. In fact, he had no purpose of his own. That had chosen him to communicate its message. This might sound very religious, but it's actually pretty simple. Within each of us, there is a center that knows everything, that is all-knowing, that knows exactly what we want, what to do with our lives. We only have to surrender ourselves to that center. But the problem is we trust our noisy mind more than our silent heart. We have given too much importance to the mental noise. Now that was his core teaching to guide people away from the noise, wherever that noise was. It could be religious noise. It could be social noise. It could be philosophical noise. When he saw that people are attaching themselves to noise, he was critical of it. And he spoke to cut them away from that noise. And the reason why he was against marriage was because he saw that as an obstacle for enlightenment. Because you are restricting your freedom. Now you're responsible for someone. You are attached to someone and then once you have children, you will have no time for your spiritual growth. One of the main reasons why he was against marriage was because he knew that marriage leads to children and that eventually takes you on a different path. It is not hard to see. An individual who is single has a lot more choices the choices are independent of social choices. 
But the moment you're married, the moment you're legally bound to an individual, you are a part of the society in a more literal sense. You can do or cannot do certain things as a husband. As an individual, you have a lot more freedom. And for spirituality, it simply made more sense to exercise your choice to be free. Other than that, he was not personally against marriage. It is said that a lot of people who were there in his ashram were married. In fact, some of them met their life partners there. Again, when he speaks against something, he does not impose it as a rule. He only talks about it and he goes back to his bathtub. It is people and their minds and what they want to do with it. If you got married and you go in front of him and say, we decided to get married, he won't hate you. He is living in a totally different space. You cannot call Osho a philosopher because what is the definition of the word philosophy? It is love of wisdom. Osho was not in love with knowledge. He was simply using knowledge as a tool. He was love. The very space he was occupying was love. There was no need to love ideas. There was no need to love words. He was just using them. In that sense, he was not a philosopher at all. Although he appears to be a wise philosopher. He was an enlightened man who found his expression through words. 